Please remain seated when the official party proceeds to the stage. 主理人士现在进场，请各位。
首国歌，请起立。Please rise for the national anthem. 现在奏国歌，请起立。各位就座 ，Please be seated， 请各位就座。Secretary for Justice, Chairman of the Bar, President of the Law Society. Fellow judges, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Hong Kong judiciary, I extend a warm welcome to all of you to the opening of the legal year. For the judiciary, the occasion is an important one because it allows me to address the public on matters concerning Hong Kong's legal system. This year, I would like to say something about the process of the courts. In other words, how cases are handled uh, by the judges and the courts, and also to give an update on the proposed extension of the retirement ages for judges. I also want to say a few words about the proliferation of cases in our courts involving non-refoulement claims. The substantially increased workload on our courts resulting from this type of case has given and will continue to provide much pressure on our courts at all levels. This past year has seen courts at every level adjudicate on controversial cases. By controversial, I'm referring to those cases which emanate from controversial political or social events and over which members of the community have at times vastly different views. Many of such views are polarized, seemingly without any common ground. It would be strictly speaking inaccurate to say that courts are caught in the middle when they are called on to handle such cases, such types of case. As I've said many times on previous occasions, it is no part of a court's function or duty to adjudicate on political or social issues, nor economic ones whether siding with one extreme or another, or finding some sort of middle ground to solve the community's political, social, or economic concerns. Rather, at all times, the court is concerned with dealing with one aspect, and one aspect only, a resolution of the legal issues arising in the dispute before it. This is saying the obvious as far as judges and those who understand the law are concerned, but perhaps not always so obvious to some others in the community. Following some judgments in the type of controversial case to which I have been referring, whether civil or criminal, there have over the past year been criticisms leveled against decisions of the courts and sometimes even personally against judges. <clears throat> Such criticisms have ranged from the abusive, which are totally unacceptable, to imputations of political bias. There have even been comments along the lines that the rule of law in Hong Kong has somehow been undermined as a result of certain decisions of the courts, including judgments of the Court of Final Appeal. It is in this context that I regard it as desirable that something should be said about the process of the courts. I make it clear again that I'm not saying that there should be no criticism of the courts and judgments. Indeed, quite the contrary. 
Constructive criticism of the courts is always welcome, and every person, of course, has the freedom of speech. Article 27 of the Basic Law guarantees the freedom of speech. However, my point is that criticism, in order to be effective and constructive, must be informed as opposed to being based on misunderstandings or inaccuracies. It is therefore important that everyone should be aware <clears throat> of just how the courts operate and handle cases. This applies to all cases, not only those which are uh, controversial. A number of points need to be made, and these embody the very characteristics of Hong Kong's legal system. First, the concept of an independent judiciary. In the discharge of their constitutional duties, judges are independent from any outside interference, and this includes the executive, the legislature, and indeed anyone else. This is reflected in the basic law to which I have already referred, and which, as the preamble states expressly, ensures the implementation of the basic policies of the PRC regarding Hong Kong. Article 2 of the basic law states that the National People's Congress authorizes Hong Kong to enjoy independent judicial power, including that of final adjudication. Article 19 repeats this, stating that the HKSAR is to be vested with independent judicial power, including that of final adjudication. Article 85 is clear in stating that Hong Kong courts shall exercise judicial power independently, free from any interference. <clears throat> the independence of judges is also reflected in the judicial oath. This oath is a solemn and sincere undertaking by every judge to uphold the basic law and to serve the HKSAR and administer, and administer justice without fear or favor, self-interest or deceit. This oath is required to be taken under Article 104 of the Basic Law. The necessity for an independent judiciary is self-evident. When the rights of individuals are sought to be enforced against others, and particularly when the executive is involved, there can be no question of the courts being in any way partial towards anyone. The scales of justice are held evenly. They are not tilted in favor of or against anyone when a legal dispute is being determined. This is perhaps another way of emphasizing the second point I wish to make, equality before the law. The statue of justice in Hong Kong, Themis at the top of the Court of Final Appeal building, not only holds the scales of justice evenly, she is blindfolded. The courts which decide the disputes before them are not predisposed in favor of or against any of the parties. The basic law requires in Article 25 that all Hong Kong residents shall be equal before the law. Article 41 states that other persons shall enjoy the same rights and freedoms set out earlier, including Article 25. Everyone is entitled to equal treatment under the law. No one is above it. This is the essence of fairness and justice. The guarantee of equality exists not only in the basic law. Article 1 of the Hong Kong Bill of Rights, contained in the Hong Kong Bill of Rights Ordinance, refers to the entitlement to rights without distinction. Article 10 states in terms that all persons shall be equal before the courts and tribunals. The Bill of Rights is the embodiment in statute uh, form of the provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Article 39 of the Basic Law states that this convention, as applied to Hong Kong, must be implemented in our laws. The ICCPR is an international instrument adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations on the 19th of December, 1966, and has 172 parties to it. Thirdly, <clears throat> in determining the outcome of cases, courts will look only to the legal issues involved. In other words, it is the law that governs the result 
in any legal dispute before the courts, even where, where a case has political, social, or economic ramifications, it is only the law that will be considered by the courts. This is what is meant by the exercise of judicial power when that term is used in those three articles of the basic law referred to earlier. The judicial oath also requires judges to serve Hong Kong conscientiously, dutifully, in full accordance with the law. A determination of the merits according to law means that no other consideration can influence the outcome of a case, and this includes those factors I've earlier identified, political, social, and economic factors. I can put this no clearer than the way it was stated by the Court of Final Appeal in a judgment given almost one year ago. It is important to state at the outset of this judgment that it is not the role or function of the courts of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region to enter into this or any other political debate. Instead, the duty of the courts is, through an independent judiciary, to administer the law of the HKSAR, including the basic law, and to adjudicate on the legal issues raised in any case according to the law. In reaching a decision in any given case, a court exclusively applies the applicable legal principles to the relevant facts and thereby reaches a decision on the appropriate disposition of the case, explaining its reasons in its judgment. That, that is the sole task of this court in these appeals. Fourthly, no system of law is complete without a proper appellate structure. We have in Hong Kong what is known as a two-tier appellate system. Appeals from the magistrate's courts first go to the court of first instance and then to the court of final appeal. Appeals from the district court go to the court of appeal and then to the court of final appeal. Appeals from the court of first instance go to the court of appeal and then to the court of final appeal. The apex of the court structure is the court of final appeal in which is vested according to Article 82 of the Basic Law, the power of final adjudication. The fifth important characteristic of Hong Kong's legal system is transparency, a facet I had dealt with in last year's speech. In order to begin to earn the community's confidence in the legal system, the work of the courts has to be transparent. Here, the following points are relevant. Court proceedings at every level are open to the public to observe, apart from a few situations that require closed hearing, such as matters involving children. The openness of court proceedings includes those controversial cases I have earlier referred to. Such cases are also widely reported by the press. The reasoning of the courts in arriving at their decisions in the form of written judgments is open to the public to read. The judgments of the court reveal in great detail the precise steps taken by the court to reach its conclusion uh, in any case. Whenever any member of the public asks the question, why has the court made the decision it has, there is a ready and comprehensive answer to this question in the form of the written judgment. There is simply no need to speculate or guess just what was behind a court's decision on any matter, much less assert that the judge might have taken into account factors extraneous to the law, such as political factors. Naturally, one can choose not to read a court's judgment, but if one is to make a meaningful and informed comment about a court's decision, it would surely be advisable as a starting point to learn just what were the reasons for the decision in the first place. The written judgments of our courts are readily accessible, whether in hard or soft form. Save in exceptional situations, they are available on the judiciary's website. I've now dealt with five important facets of Hong Kong's legal system. The purpose of this exercise is to provide the necessary context within which to enable everyone properly to appraise and comment on the work of the courts in, 
in particular those decisions of the courts on matters which greatly concern the community. We live in a complex society and a complex world in which people constantly and critically question the validity of decisions which affect them. Sometimes these decisions may not be easy to grasp. And when reasonable points of view of different people pull in, different, pull in opposite directions, the need to understand matters in proper context becomes even more pronounced. I cannot emphasize enough the necessity of having the community's confidence in what we do. The significance of this lies, of course, not just in understanding that what the judiciary does is of considerable relevance to the community, but more important, it demonstrates the existence of the rule of law in operation in Hong Kong. There are perhaps few things that are more important to Hong Kong than our rule of law, and this is a feature of our community we must strive to maintain. As I mentioned at the outset, when I assumed office over eight years ago, this is my mission as Chief Justice. As the judiciary prepares to face challenges this coming year, it is vital that the quality of judges remains high. Although we have a judiciary that is much respected, this has been the strong impression I have gained from the exchanges I've had with judges from other jurisdictions, including the mainland, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Singapore, and the USA. The maintenance of high standards is key to the proper administration of justice. I've earlier mentioned the confidence which I hope the community has in our legal system. This confidence is shared outside Hong Kong. One indication of this is the volume of cases dealt with in our courts. By world standards, the workload of Hong Kong judges is among the heaviest and the most complex. Many persons choose to litigate in Hong Kong courts precisely because they have confidence in our legal system. What I've just said underlines the necessity of having the best quality judges in the Hong Kong judiciary. I have in the past given details of measures we have implemented to try to attract the best candidates to join the judiciary. One of the means to attract candidates of sufficiently high judicial and professional qualities, the criteria stipulated in Article 92 of the Basic Law, is to extend the retirement ages of judges at all levels of court. As I mentioned last year, Hong Kong has unrealistically low retirement ages for judges by comparison with other common law jurisdictions. There is little doubt that an extension of retirement ages will greatly assist in both the recruitment of judges and also the retention of experienced judges. The proposed extension of retirement ages has widespread support from the government, legislators, and both branches of the legal profession. This support is to be welcomed, and I am grateful for it. Of course, legislative amendments have to be made, and the drafting exercise has reached an advanced stage. I sincerely hope that all necessary legislation will be passed and made effective by the middle of the year. This is very much in the public interest and for the good of the community. The final matter I wish to touch upon this evening is related to the heavy caseload I've earlier mentioned. Particularly in recent years, Hong Kong has seen an influx of persons who have made non-refoulement claims, commonly known as torture claims. Hong Kong is subject to the Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, commonly known as the Convention Against Torture, or CAT, C-A-T. When a person claims that there are substantial grounds for believing that he or she would be in danger of being subjected to torture or risk of cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, persecution, etc., in another place, no party subject to the CAT can repatriate that person to that place. In recent years, the government has had to deal with a very large number of such non-refoulement claims. 
The process of dealing with such claims frequently involves the following. After the Immigration Department has processed an application, if an applicant is dissatisfied with the result, he or she may launch an administrative appeal to the Torture Claims Appeal Board. In the event that the board rejects the appeal, what has turned out to be the usual course is then to seek relief by way of an application for leave to apply for judicial review to the Court of First Instance. If this is refused, the decision is then appealed to the Court of Appeal and from there to the Court of Final Appeal. The volume of cases dealt with by the Court of First Instance and the Court of Appeal is high, and this has resulted in much pressure put on these courts. The pressure is also felt in the Court of Final Appeal. All cases are carefully considered at each level of court, and as a result, delays are perhaps inevitable. Additional resources will naturally be required, but this alone cannot solve all the problems. For example, more judges will be needed, and this is not just a matter of fin uh, financial resources. Further, the deployment of manpower and resources to dealing with non refoulement claims will certainly have an adverse impact on how we deal with other cases and other judicial work. The judiciary will be liaising with the Department of Justice with a view to exploring the possibility of introducing modest legislative amendments so as to facilitate a more efficient handling of such torture claims. Relevant stakeholders will of course be consulted. I hope that we can count again on the support of everyone. I end this year's speech with an assurance to the community that all our judges at all levels are totally committed to those ideals I've endeavoured to articulate. Each is committed to the rule of law and to serving the community. Service to the community is a key element in the judicial oath and every judge abides by this solemn promise. I wish all of you and your families a fulfilling 2019 and happiness in the coming year of the pig. Thank you. Chief Justice, members of the Judiciary, <clears throat> Chairman of the Bar Association, President of the Law Society, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. In the past year, our commitment to the rule of law has helped inform, augment, and re-energize our work in confronting a range of challenges, from providing professional, impartial, and independent deliverables to promoting good governance and legality in governmental decisions and actions, and ensuring equal and fair opportunities for all. One fundamental aspect of the constitutional order of Hong Kong that is sometimes overlooked is that it is premised on both the constitution of the People's Republic of China and the basic law of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. As the Court of Final Appeals stated in Democratic Republic of the Congo versus FG Hemisphere Associates, the HKSAR was established by the National People's Congress pursuant to Article 31 of the Chinese Constitution. It did so by promulgating the Basic Law of 4 April 1990. The PRC Constitution has also been referred to in a number of important judgments, including those of the Court of Final Appeal. In one case, Sir Anthony Mason, NPJ, reminded us that the basic law is a national law of the PLC being an, being an enactment of the National People's Congress made in the exercise of the legislative powers conferred upon the NPC by the PLC Constitution. In another case, Lord Cook of Thondon, NPJ, referred to the preamble of the PRC Constitution when dealing with the question of the recognition of a Taiwan court order. 
that the PRC Constitution and the Basic Law together form the constitutional basis of Hong Kong SAR cannot be seriously disputed, whether as a matter of law or fact. Like any other legal problem, the interpretation and extent of the application of the provisions of these two laws will be a matter that has to be analyzed by applying the proper applicable law and in context, in particular with Article 11 of the basic law in mind, so as to derive a legally correct result. Another matter that cannot be disputed is that the common law is maintained and continues to develop in Hong Kong as guaranteed by Article 8 of the Basic Law. One should appreciate that here, the common law refers to the common law of Hong Kong. As pithily stated by Lord Millet and PJ in China Field Limited and the Pew Tribunal Buildings No. 2, our judges must develop the common law of Hong Kong to suit the circumstances of Hong Kong. It is well recognized that the common law is no longer monolithic, but may evolve differently in the various common law jurisdictions. The Court of Final Appeal will continue to respect and have regard to decisions of the English courts, but it will decline to adopt them, not only when it considers their reasoning to be unsound or contrary to principle, or unsuitable for the circumstances of Hong Kong, but also when it considers that the law of Hong Kong should be developed on different lines. Writing extrajudicially, Sir Anthony Mason put it this way, the differences that distinguish the jurisprudence of various common law jurisdictions are largely doctrinal. The variations in doctrine may be attributed, however, to different judicial responses to variations in the material circumstances and conditions of society in the various jurisdictions, or to different judicial perceptions about particular societal values. Bearing in mind these jurisprudential uh, notions allow us to appreciate the beauty of the common law the ability to adapt to evolving circumstances in the development of a legal system that tailors to what is asked of it, given the social, cultural, and economic fabric of our society. Another major appeal of the common law, of which the case law forms an indispensable part, is that detailed reasons, including the legal analysis and findings of fact, are set out in the judgments. Unfortunately, we have seen totally baseless, arbitrary, and even malicious attacks on some of our judges simply because the outcome of particular cases was not to the liking of those making the attacks. Such acts and utterances are not to be tolerated, and where evidence and circumstances justify, legal action will be taken. Careful reading and correct understanding of court judgments would often dispel any unwarranted misunderstanding. With a view to raising public awareness and assisting the public to better understand significant decisions of the courts, the Department of Justice has prepared summaries of judgments of notable cases with substantial media or public interest. They are made available on the department's website shortly after the judgments are handed down. We hope that this initiative, together with the Hong Kong e-legislation database, which provides free access to all legislation of Hong Kong, would enhance accessibility of the law for the general public and foster better understanding of the law so as to encourage healthy and informed discussions. Our rule of law and common law system have together formed a solid foundation of Hong Kong's status as a leading center for international legal and dispute resolution services in the Asia Pacific region. It is reported that to a majority of developing countries covered by the Belt and Road routes, Hong Kong believes it offers the promise of a mature and independent legal system and a neutral venue to resolve disputes arising between parties from the region's complex political and legal cultures. Whilst it is also reported that the Department of Justice recently has been more pro active in getting Hong Kong's name out as a dispute resolution hub for Asia-related cases and launched other initiatives, 
we should not be complacent about our existing competitive edge. Indeed, we have not overlooked the keen competition posed by other jurisdictions in this region and beyond. No doubt, there is a pressing need for our legal practitioners and the Department of Justice to be more proactive and join hands to strengthen the interface between the local and international legal communities, thereby facilitating the export of our legal services, enhancing Hong Kong as a leading legal and dispute resolution center, and importantly, conveying the strength of our rule of law. To better cope with the challenges and to harness the additional opportunities offered by the Belt and Road Initiative and the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, the Inclusive Dispute Avoidance and Resolution Office, IDAR Office, has been established within the Department of Justice, which will work directly under my steer. The establishment of the EDA office will help better coordinate and implement various initiatives that the department has been undertaking in the areas of dispute avoidance and resolution. The EDA office will pursue and conclude cooperation or partnership arrangements with other jurisdictions and international organizations. It will also organize, support, and encourage a number of international events and activities in Hong Kong, as well as raise the international profile of Hong Kong in deal-making and dispute resolution through capacity building and promotional activities overseas. The EDA officer's objective is to facilitate access to justice and provide equal opportunities for people from all walks of life and for all sectors of the economy without boundary, advancing Goal 16 of the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals in this region and beyond. Goal 16 emphasizes the promotion of peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. The, pro the provision of access to justice for all, and the building of effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. As President Xi explained, the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals are part of our national development strategies, and we should promote coordinated advances in the economic, social, and environmental fields, pursue inclusive development in keeping with our respective na national conditions, and forge equal and balanced global development partnerships. The promotion of mediation has long been an important focus. Domestically, last year saw the milestone of the opening of the West Kowloon Mediation Center and the implementation of the pilot mediation scheme for small claims tribunal and other suitable cases. At the cross-boundary level, the mediation mechanism for investment disputes established in accordance with the investment agreement under the framework of the mainland and Hong Kong Closer Economic Partnership Arrangement was implemented in December 2018. The lists of mediation institutions and mediators mutually agreed by the two sides have been published. In the light of the international trend and with the SEPA mediation mechanism in place, we have, together with the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes of the World Bank Group and the Asian Academy of International Law, launched a training course on investment law and investment mediation skills in October 2018, which was the first in Asia. We plan to conduct further rounds of such training with the goals of building up a team of investment mediators in Asia and developing Hong Kong into an international investment law and international investment dispute resolution skills training base. The department is actively pursuing and formulating how to capitalize on Hong Kong's strengths established over the years in mediation to better serve the local and international communities in light of the opportunities that are available under the Belt and Road Initiative and the Greater Bay Area Plan. Turning to arbitration, the code of practice for the third party funding for arbitration was issued on the 7th of December last year, and on the same day, a commencement notice to bring the relevant provisions of the arbitration ordinance into operation was gazetted. The new regime for the third party funding of, for arbitration will come into operation on the 1st of February. 
All these advances in legal infrastructure are complemented by the new physical infrastructure which supports dispute resolution and other legal services in the most tangible way. The renovation works of the legal hub in the west wing of the former central government offices and the nearby heritage listed former French mission building are making good progress and due to be completed by the first quarter of this year and mid-2020 respectively. Another important area of development is the use of technology in the provision of legal services. In 2016, the United Nations General Assembly observed that online dispute resolution can assist the parties in resolving the dispute in a simple, fast, flexible and secure manner without the need of physical presence at a meeting or hearing. More recently, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation has responded to the call and is currently embarking on a project to establish an ODR platform with micro, small and medium-sized enterprises as major beneficiaries. The Chief Executive announced in her 2018 policy address that the government supports the development by NGOs of a Belt and Road e-arbitration and e-mediation platform so that Hong Kong will be able to provide efficient and cost-effective online dispute resolution services. The government will provide funding for the cost of development of, of, development of this meaningful project, and we are now working very closely with the stakeholders in the development of the ODR platform and also taking a lead in the ODR project under APAC. While we seek to reap the benefits of new technologies, the challenges posed by them cannot be ignored. The Law Reform Commission is well aware of the rapid developments in this area, as well as the potential for new technologies to be exploited for carrying out criminal activities. Therefore, a subcommittee has recently been formed to study the topic of cybercrime. I am pleased to announce that the long-awaited arrangement between Hong Kong and mainland on reciprocal recognition and enforcement of judgments and in civil and commercial matters will be concluded and signed in the near future. With the generous and expert assistance from the legal sector, Efforts have also been stepped up in the department to pursue the study of establishing a legal mechanism between Hong Kong and mainland for mutual recognition of and assistance in insolvency and corporate debt restructuring matters. Other measures and arrangements that will, and that will enhance Hong Kong's position as a dispute resolution legal hub are being actively discussed with promising feedback. Since taking the office, I have been eager to engage and hear from the legal profession. Through quarterly meetings with the Bar Association and Law Society, we have established a channel of communication for frank and open exchange of issues of concern to legal practitioners. The department's briefing out policy has been under review since our first meetings, and some fruitful outcome has been achieved last year, with emphasis on the exploration of opportunities for young practitioners. Measure to facilitate wider use of Hong Kong's high quality, renowned and professional legal services will continue to be pursued. None of the progress achieved in the past year would have been possible without the dedication and devotion of my colleagues in the department and the contributions of the legal practitioners in private practice. I express my sincerest gratitude to them for their efforts. In these efforts to strengthen the rule of law, the department that I am privileged to lead is honored to be part of Hong Kong's strong, robust, and professional legal fraternity. Like you, we approach the challenges ahead with resolve, humility, and professionalism. We are eager to join hands in driving this work into the future. Thank you very much.
Chief Justice, Secretary for Justice, President of the Law Society, judges, distinguished guests, members of the legal profession, ladies and gentlemen. At this occasion last year, and in fact this year, the Chief Justice spoke about a precious constitutional asset in which we all share. That asset is an independent judiciary. The Chief Justice has rightly explained and dwelled upon the significance of independence when judges and magistrates exercise on a daily basis the judicial power that's vested in them and the courts under Article 80 of the Basic Law. I speak to you today about another kind of independence. That is, the independence of the bar as an organization and of the personal independence of its members. I will, I hope, demonstrate to you that an independent bar is important as an independent judiciary and that there is a symbiotic relationship between bar and bench so that you can say that where there is a strong bar, you will find a strong bench. I believe it right to choose this as a theme of my speech because now is the time when old certainties seem to be no longer quite so certain and some people question the law's future direction in the Hong Kong Special Admitted Region. I feel that I need, on behalf of the Bar, to give some assurances about the Bar's role under the constitutional settlement that is our basic law. I start by going to the ancient heritage of both the Bar and the Bench, which is the common law. I would say, and this is my own view, that the most precious gift to the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region on its establishment just over 20 years ago was the common law. The common law is, as you all know, hundreds of years old. It grew to maturity in England, but it spread across the world. Its basic principles are the same in New Delhi, in New York, and in Melbourne, and Manchester. Its jewels include habeas corpus, trial by jury, the Petition of Right of 1628, the body of mercantile law developed by 18th century judges that even now continues to regulate international commercial arrangements, judicial review, the common law's inherent flexibility and adaptability, and finally, the legacy of judicial wisdom and experience through the doctrine of precedent which is the distillation of the best principles that resonate and shape civil society. The doctrine of precedent even made it into a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson when describing life in a country under the common law. A land of settled government, a land of just and old renown, where freedom slowly broadens down from precedent to precedent. Common law practitioners have inherited the habit of independent thought and attitude that developed as a common law emerged from dangerous tussles with medieval English kings and even more perilous confrontations of the courts with the more powerful Stuart monarchs in the 17th century. That habit of independence born out of constitutional struggle is needed for the common law to survive and to prosper. Our judges, many of them former barristers, depend on the bar's independence to ensure that legal arguments are presented honestly but with force and vigour. When barristers argue difficult points in cases of importance in this way, judges can have the confidence that, whatever the decision in the case might be, it should have a solid foundation in the wisdom and the values of the common law. The judgment may be that of Judge X or Judge Y, but in reality it's a product of a collaborative effort of the bench and bar to ascertain the legal principle that governs the facts of a particular case. A United States Supreme Court Justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes, paid a handsome tribute to the road of the bar when he said, shall I ask what a court would be unaided? The law is made by the bar even more than by the bench. A more fulsome 
a flowery tribute to the bar's independence is made by a legal scholar, Sir Frederick Pollock, writing just over a century ago. Pollock described the relationship of bench and bar in this way, in his book, The Genius of the Common Law, where the common law is given a female personality called Our Lady. The language is dated, but the message is still relevant and will continue to be relevant so long as the common law endures. Our Lady, the common law, looks for trusted servants who will stand by her in the day of need. She demands fearless and independent judges drawn from the fearless and independent bar. Men who will not swerve from the straight path to the right hand for any pleasure of rulers, be they aristocratic or democratic, nor be drawn aside to the left by the more insidious temptation of finding popular favour in opposition. If our ladies' servants are not of that spirit, all the learning of all their books will not save them from disgrace or her realm from ruin. If they are, we shall never see the enemy whom she and they would be afraid to speak with in the gate, within the gate. The benefits of independent counsel are you case fully and with conviction are not just for judges. The public are also beneficiaries. Many provisions of the bar's code of conduct are there to promote independence of thought and action outside of the court. This independence is paradoxically qualified by a professional rule that binds all practicing barristers and limits their freedom of action. It is the rule that constrains a barrister to accept instructions in types of cases where he normally, which he normally undertakes on terms that are not exorbitant, no matter the personality of the client or the nature of the case. The cab rat rule, so it's called, ensures that no one will be denied representation because they are who they are or their cause is unpopular. The rule is also meant to ensure that barristers do not suffer adverse consequences that might follow from taking on a particular client or cause. A former non-permanent judge of our Court of Final Appeal, Gerard Brenner, described the importance of the rule in a case in Australia in 1988. Whatever the origin of the rule, its observance is essential to the availability of justice according to law. It's difficult enough to ensure that justice according to law is generally available. It's unacceptable that the privilege of legal representation should be available only according to the predilections of counsel or only on the payment of extravagant fees. If access to legal representation before the courts are dependent on counsel's predilections as to the acceptability of the cause or the munificence of the client, it will be difficult to bring unpopular causes to court and the pressure of profession will be become the puppet of the powerful. This is a rule of professional conduct that I wish were better known and understood because some people still associate individual counsel with the cause of their clients, which is quite unfair to the barristers concerned. Out of court independence means also giving legal advice that persons seeking advice may rather not receive. Clients should not go to a barrister to hear what they want to hear. They need rather go to go rather to hear what they need to hear. When in court, this means a barrister not giving up and the all important discretion as to how to conduct litigation. On the unworthy terms, a Victorian judge once put it, that he should be the mouthpiece of his client. I emphasize that the bar's professional services are available to all who might seek to use them, whether the clients are private individuals, small businessmen, big corporations, public bodies, or even the Hong Kong government. A long-time user of the many talents available at the bar, whether an advocate's skills are sought for court work or just frank, independent advice is required. To the individual barrister, these clients are all the same under the law. They all command counsels and stinting efforts to see that they have the opportunity of access to equal and exact justice in our courts. I turn now to the bar as an institution. 
The Bar demonstrates its independence when its governing body, the Bar Council, occasionally makes public statements about current legal issues concerning the public. Sometimes the Bar speaks out because criticism of court judgments questions the independence and neutrality of judges. Sometimes it may be because there's blatant misinformation about a case, or more shockingly, personal attacks on judges. This is a topic addressed by my predecessor last year. I make no apologies to return to the subject because unwarranted attacks on our judges have not stopped. Unless they are abetted promptly and effectively, they will have a corrosive effect on trust in the judiciary. Sometimes the bar feels constrained to speak out on legal issues that concern the general public. The bar has done this for many, many years. Where people take a view on legal issue, which also has a political dimension, the bar is often accused of playing politics should its views coincide with one side and not another's. I can assure you that the bar holds that the state of the law is equal for all people and it cannot depend on a political stance or attitude. In any event, issues which cannot be solved by the executive branch of government or the legislature have a tendency to end up in the courts, particularly when those issues concern one or more articles of the basic law. I take comfort in the fact that it was ever so, at least for a society existing under a written constitution that is not a mere tinseled edifice or a catalogue of wordy aspirations rather than being a table of effective enforceable rights. Alexis de Tocqueville, a 19th century French historian who studied early American democracy, said of the subject of his study, scarcely any question arises in the United States which does not become sooner or later a subject of judicial debate. He should be living now in Hong Kong. I boast of the independence of the injured barristers and the bar collectively, but fine words butter no parsnips. In order to remain strong and continue to serve both the public at large and the judiciary, the bar needs to move with the times. The Bar Council has recently initiated changes which will only work to strengthen the bar by making it more accessible to men and women who wish to become barristers. First, the Bar Council approved changes to rules about pupils that will require pupil masters to see that they are paid a minimum sum by way of remuneration from this September. Starting out of the bar has always been challenging to most entrants. It's been daunting even. This change would, I hope, be that no one will be unable to join the bar only because of a lack of finances. Second, the Bar Council has also removed paternalistic rules restricting barristers from having other occupations that are not incompatible with practice of the bar. It's no longer necessary to seek the Bar Council's approval to undertake additional remunerated work. A barrister must be sure, though, whatever they do, it will not bring the profession into disrepute. It will, in future, be possible to be both a barrister and a barista, but not at the same time. <laughs> Third, the Bar Council decided last year to introduce a scheme for continuing legal education. This change has been long overdue. I expect that the next Bar Council, that's the one that will be uh, in force this year, will plan the kinds of courses that can be taken so to satisfy a new requirement that members must demonstrate each year, each year that they met their obligation. Until such time as a full range of educational options is drawn up, members will be encouraged to sample what can be offered by way of a, a soft opening of the scheme. Lastly, I was pleased to see the Bar Council agree to establish a new standing committee on equality and diversity. I expect the committee to advise on best practices to chambers to ensure that no discriminatory practice exists that may affect the recruitment of new members and inhibit the development of barristers' individual practices. The Bar Council is aware of the fact that many women barristers have difficulties maintaining their practice when bringing up a family. Some give up practice when they can no longer combine legal work with the demands of a family. This is bad for the Bar. It's also bad for the judiciary who lose potential judges and magistrates when women drop out of practice at the bar. I hope that this new standing committee can suggest ways 
to solve this problem. I conclude by wishing you all a happy and prosperous new year. And for those of you who may be having difficulty in sticking to rashly made resolutions made a, just a fortnight ago, to take comfort from Oscar Wilde, who observed that New Year's resolutions were just checks that men draw at a bank where they have no account. I thank you. Chief Justice, Secretary for Justice, Chairman of the Hong Kong Bar Association, <laughs> members of the judiciary, members of the legal professions, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Over the past year, there were many challenges in Hong Kong. Politicians across our diverse political spectrum has expressed their different and oftentimes conflicting views in relation to legal cases in Hong Kong. Sometimes it is regrettable that judges and our legal system were being attacked depending on the outcome of the particular cases and naturally one's political views. On 4th July 2018, the Law Society and the Bar Association jointly issue a statement and I quote, the Law Society of Hong Kong and the Hong Kong Bar Association urge members of the public to express their views in a manner conducive to rational debate. Personal attacks on judges have no place in rational discourse and debate. That is the hallmark of a civil society. This opening of the legal year ceremony to our members sends a very important message to our community that our judges, our judiciary, our legal system are fiercely independent. As Chief Justice Ma, in a speech given at the Melbourne Law School, University of Melbourne, on 23rd of May 2018, stated that, no doubt some people will only look at the actual result of cases determined by the courts in order to evaluate the integrity or effectiveness of a legal system. This is a wrong approach. One ought to be more concerned with fundamentals and matters of principle. For many people, while a decision of the court may be an unpopular one, this is not as important as an assurance that every time a judicial decision is made, the court has acted in accordance with principle, according to the law and proper procedure, and above all has acted independently. We live in an increasingly de divided world. In an article recently published in The Economist titled, Do Social Media Threaten Democracy? The author insightfully observed, Facebook, Google, and Twitter were supposed to save politics as good information drove out prejudice and falsehood. Something has gone very wrong. Everyone who has scrolled through Facebook knows how. Instead of imparting wisdom, the system dishes out compulsive stuff that tends to reinforce people's biases. Because different sides see different things, they share no empirical basis for reaching a compromise. Because each side hears time and again that the other lot are good for nothing but lying, that faint and slander. The system has even less room for empathy. Because people are stuck into a maelstrom of pettiness, scandal and outrage, they lose sight of what matters for the society they share. This tends to discredit the compromises and subtleties of liberal democracy and to boost the politicians who feed off conspiracy and nativism. 
In these testing and challenging times, when conflicts rather than compromises are being celebrated, it is all the more important for us, members of the legal professions and fraternity, to defend our value legal system. I have no doubt, and it is an undisputed fact, that in Hong Kong, our judges administer the law and dispense justice according to sound legal principles without fear or favor. The Rule of Law Index under the World Justice Project is often cited to showcase Hong Kong's judicial independence. Hong Kong is ranked 16 out of 113 countries and jurisdictions in 2017 to 18. However, I think if we were to compile a new index on the ease and frequency of the government being sued by citizens, Hong Kong can easily top the table. In Hong Kong, we are fortunate to have a sound legal system, an independent judiciary, for our practitioners to deliver their professional services. It is our duty to defend our value system and its reputation. However, we cannot rest on our own laurels. Time moves on, so do legal practice and legal demographic distribution. Talking about diversity, the Law Society has long adopted a very clear statement of diversity and inclusion principle. The council election of myself, Vice Presidents Amirali Nasir, Brian Grochrist, and CM Chen, who represent diversity in gender, culture, religion, ethnicity, and legal practice, speaks volumes about the inclusion culture at the council. A diverse workforce is more sensitive to cultural differences and enriches the network of the operation. The Law Society will continue to help practitioners to embrace diversity and inclusion in their practices. As we study the, as we study the experiences of other jurisdictions in advancing the principles of diversity and inclusion, the collection of relevant data relating to gender, ethnicity, disability, and other areas is a major first step, and the Law Society will be conducting a membership-wide survey to collect more information in the coming year. The striking phenomenon of an increasing number of legal practitioners working in-house seems to be a world trend. In Hong Kong, one in four practicing solicitor works in-house. Since 2011, the Law Society has set up an in-house lawyers committee to provide a platform for in-house lawyers to share experiences and insights on their work and to strengthen their communication with fellow members in private practice. The Law Society will continue to allocate sufficient resources to serve this sizable sector comprising 25% of our practicing members. The legal profession, which is known for its recalcitrance to innovation, has reached a tipping point. The legal, regulatory, and business demands that lawyers must help their clients navigate even more quickly by the day, has pushed many practitioners who want to remain relevant to look towards technological solutions for assistance. However, embracing technology to drive efficiencies and value on micro and macro levels come with challenges. Technology must be utilized in a responsible way. At the second Belt and Road Conference, organized by the Law Society in September 2018, we initiated the signing of a Law Tech Alliance among 34 law associations from 17 jurisdictions, which all have the common goal of ensuring that the legal profession takes advantage of legal tech in an ethical, professional, and responsible manner. The future generation of the legal profession should be equipped with the knowledge and skills to inspire the development of new technologies for the improvement of legal practice. 
practitioners should be capably supervising the use of new technologies, not competing with them. To nurture interest in developing technology to enhance legal practice, the Law Society has organized the InnoTech Law Hackathon annually since 2017. In the two Law Society hackathons, nearly 40 different law tech solutions aim at improving access to justice and enhancing delivery of legal services were produced by teams involving around 200 individual participants with backgrounds in law and 